Do you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. Outstanding. And I've clicked the live record button here. Uh -huh. And now I'm trying to get it. All right, now I noticed on the recording from last time that it showed the whole gallery of everybody that was logged in. And what I want it to do is show the person who's speaking. So let me just see if I can figure out where that setting is. I think it's speaker view. That'll do it. Now, if you make noise, it shows you. Um, I think so. I'm unmuted. I'm going to turn my video on. All right. Now you can not only hear me, but you can see me, right? Yes. All right. And um, am I sharing my screen? No. Perfect. That was what I thought I was doing. All right. So I'm not sharing the screen. You can hear me. You can see me. Um, I just want to say I got written on the whiteboard here. We're going to do three Zoom lectures next week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, all at the 11 to 12. Uh, that, that's all on your schedule. I don't normally do the Wednesday one, but we got a lot of stuff to cover next week. And I've noticed also that for some reason, it seems to take me longer to get through the material on Zoom here. Um, it's really weird because I'm, I'm pretty sure that when I'm in lecture, I go off on a lot of tangents when I'm in the classroom. I go off on, on way more tangents than I do here. But uh, I, I don't know. Maybe it's because I want to talk more about the lab stuff because you're not doing as much of the lab stuff in lab. But at any rate, I seem to be, well, I don't seem to be. I am actually behind the schedule that I intended. So I'm going to try to catch up. And, uh, and next week, we've got a lot of stuff to cover. And it's probably the most math intensive part of the class. So, um, so I guess be prepared to stay awake next week. I noticed that as we go through the, the term here, that fewer and fewer of you seem to be uh, sharing your video with me. At the beginning, a lot of people had their video on, and, uh, and now it seems like only a few people have their video on. I get that. You may be laying in bed. Maybe you don't have any pants on. I don't know. It's uh, living from home, right? Or working from home. So, oh, well, let me open the chat window so people are talking there. Uh, somehow I can drag this down. All right. So, okay. All right. Oh, some people don't have a video camera. Some people still in their PJs. Uh, for the quizzes, there are multiple attempts. That was a valid question. Doesn't it tell you? We've still got the noisy door. I'm going to have to get some oil and fix that. Um, does it, it I, think, I, think, I think when you start it, it tells you that you have unlimited attempts. Um, I believe I also set it to show your answer at the end of each attempt. Um, and to indicate whether or not your answer was correct. Now, it seems like it's very easy to game the system then because you could just keep trying until you get the right answer. And even if I think that's what you're doing, I'm not going to penalize you for it, but I think it is easier to actually learn the material than it is to game the system. There's, I think, 20... 21 questions for a total of 25 points. One of the questions is worth five points. Um, and that one won't tell you the correct answer because that's an essay question. I'm going to read what you say. But um, of, the other, of the other 20 points that are available, it's 20 questions that each have 10 versions. And so each time you take the test, you'll get the same question, but with different numbers. They're all pretty mathematical questions, I guess, all those. And so 
it'll have the same words, but different numbers. So the answer won't be the same. So you can't really game the system to do that. Um, it's way easier to just figure out how to answer the questions. Uh, I don't believe I have ever asked a question on a quiz that you couldn't figure out the answer by using Google. And all of the quizzes that I give are open notes, open, open anything, I suppose. Up until the final exam, I actually don't even care if you talk with each other. So if you talk to the people in your group about the questions, it's okay. Um, I suppose if you did it enough times, you could figure out what all of the correct answers are for all of the questions. I'm gonna say one more thing about the quiz questions and the automatic grading, especially of the numeric questions. It could be mistaken. So don't keep trying to do a question to get the answer that Canvas says is correct. Do the questions so that you believe you have the correct answer. If you believe there is a problem with the grading of your quiz, let me know, but I can't fix it until after the quiz is over. But, uh, but if you think something's grading incorrectly, you can ask me about it, I'll look at it. Don't ask about it half an hour before the quiz is due at midnight because I won't be checking my email then. Uh, but if you do think there's a problem, I can do that. Uh, I think it's due on Monday at midnight. I pushed back the due date for the group assignment one because I realized I hadn't actually given you a place to submit it. <clears throat> so that submission there is now. If you've already emailed me the thing or something like that, please just take the file and upload it into the submission. It makes the grading that much easier. And, and please get that done by, I think it was Friday that I put on the assignment. Well, let me quickly go into Canvas here and screen share. Where's the button? Somewhere there's a button for screen sharing. I've lost Zoom altogether. There's Zoom. Um, more. Share screen. Okay, and I want to share screen two. Share. Okay, so in here in the assignments, I cleaned a bunch of stuff up. So I put in assignments for <clears throat> for the uh, learn, WPI Learn C and C for week one and week three. If you look at the week one assignment, and I didn't put any due dates, and I won't put any due dates for the uh, the WPI Learn the WPI C and C stuff that we go through. So it says so complete the steps for basic manual operations, and I think you guys have all done this, um, and that these steps will be graded pass fail and self reported. If you need a quiz reset after tonight, you'll be able to ask the PLA and they can reset the quizzes. Um, but so what we want you to do is to do the materials. I don't care what your grade is on those quizzes. I just want you to have gone through the materials. Um, and uh, if we look at the question, this is posted as a quiz, right? So I can preview it. The question is the same as the instructions, complete these steps and then a checkbox. I have completed these steps. I have not completed these steps. I assume that you can determine what the correct answer is here to get full credit for doing the quiz. Um, so, so just go ahead and uh, click. You have completed the steps once you've done that, and that way it'll help us get it into the grade book here. Uh, the other thing I've got here, so quizzes, so assignments. So your midterm quiz is there. It's due on Monday, 11.59. Um, I'm getting the CAM 3 assignment posted up there. And those week two, the group one assignments there. I'll post the group two assignment after we're done talking about it today at the end of class. And uh, CAM three. I actually want to talk about CAM three for just a second here. So we've got all of the, uh, the CAM stuff 
if we go over here, we go to getting started with cam, open that up and read. So you're, you were supposed to do chapters four and five this week and then answer the question for the CAM2 assignment, right? So you're up doing through this stuff right now. I think the last step in chapter five is to do this chamfer. And then the next page, there's a mistake. Right here where it says chapter five, review of two axis milling. That's supposed to say chapter six. I'm hoping that we can all agree to just imagine that that says chapter six. So I don't have to update the book again because it takes about four hours to go through and fix all the links before it gets posted um, every time you update it. So I'm, I'm assuming that we can say that this says chapter six that this says chapter 6.1, that when we get over here, oh, oh, this one will say chapter 6.2. And when we're done with chapter 6.2 and we get to the one that actually says chapter six, you could just, call that chapter six or 6.3 and we just go through. But what uh, for, for CAM assignment three, I want you to get up to the end of the book. So from what you finished at the end of CAM assignment two through the end of the book. And then uh, you'll be able to answer the questions for CAM assignment three, which is gonna be due next Friday. Um, how's the CAM going? Now that you've been in labs for a few weeks. Well, it's going good. All right, I get a, it's going good in the well. Anybody else have a comment? I don't think they're too bad. All right, sounds good. I'll, I'll just do it. Right. It's been all right. All right, so nobody's saying that it's bad, so I'm going to assume that it's perfect. Um, and unless somebody wants to tell me, and if you don't want to tell me in public here and you want to tell me, in private later, we can do that too. What are we What are we talking about today in class? Does anybody remember? Surface metrology. Surface metrology, right? Not surface meteorology, but surface metrology. I had a new share. I think I had this slide up when we started. Right? Is that sharing? Share. Click the button. So I think I had this up when we started earlier in the uh, in the Zoom today. What's the difference between precision and accuracy? What to say hi, Emily? You gotta jump to say hi. Jump one, two, three, jump. Hello. Show everybody, Mr. Mr. Panda Face. It's Sir Panda Face. Sir Panda Face. Okay. Hello, sir, you... panda face. <laughs> we had a crisis just before class started because we couldn't find Sir Panda face. Turns out he was on the kitchen table. Okay, so what's the difference between precision and accuracy? Accuracy is the ability to get close to the required goal. Precision is the ability to keep the whatever measurement close to each other. Close to So when I was in like third grade, I had to learn how to spell the word together. And the way I remembered it was to get her. And I've been out of third grade for 40 some years. And every time I write the word together in my head, I say to get her. Is that weird? No. I do a similar thing for Wednesday. Just write Wednesday. 
Yeah, I do Wednesday also. All right. So you said that accuracy is close to the goal and that precision is close together. Uh, do the, the poll thing and participants. Is that correct? Got to see if you guys are awake. We got to do the poll. If not, I'm going to make everybody stand up and turn their camera on. Oh, a lot of responses came in when I said you had to turn your camera on. Okay. So nobody says that this is incorrect. Wait, no. Can I respond? Oh, I can respond. Cool. I think it's really close to correct. And it's almost accurate. But... Uh, you guys can't see the board anymore because I'm sharing, right? Stop share. So I think that we're right on with precision. Precision is when the things that we're doing are close together. And so, uh, so if you've ever played a game of darts on the dartboard and you get up there and you throw the dart, it, it goes not where you intended for it to go. And then you get up there and you throw the next dart and it goes not where you intended for it to go, but right next to the first one, you're being precise, right? So your, your darts, and, and we usually say in, in a game of darts, we'd say, oh, nice grouping. Um, if you want to get it to the place, and, and this is, I think this is where the, the goal definition came in is we're, we're shooting for 20. Actually, we're shooting for triple 20. And we get them all in triple, what's next to 20? I think one is right next to 20. We get them all in the triple one instead of the triple 20. Um, we were precise, but we weren't accurate. It, in a better definition, instead of close to the goal, if we're talking about, especially if we're talking about precision and accuracy with regard to measurement, we want to say that accuracy is close to the true value. Can we ever be perfectly accurate? Not unless you have perfect precision. Um, you say not unless we have perfect precision. I don't think it depends on our precision. We could be we could be accurate accurate and not precise. As long as as long as we only count on one of our things being the true value. But can we ever be perfectly accurate? Um, would we even be able to tell what is perfectly accurate? I think that's the problem. It's we we may be able to be perfectly accurate, but we'll never actually know if we are. So because how do we actually know what the true value is? We can only know what we what we've measured or what we've assumed the true value to be, but we can't ever really know the true value. That's kind of a um, I don't know philosophical point who are engineers, scientists, and philosophers today. But, um, but we could get pretty close. How do we estimate our best guess of what the true value is? What's, what's the best way to, to guesstimate the true value? Take a collection of measurements. Take a collection of measurements. So we collect measurements. Is that all? Take the average of those measurements. To take the average, so collect, we'll call them samples. So we're going to sample the thing we're measuring. We're going to, in average, them. So we could take a sample of measurements, we could average them together. Is that enough? We definitely want to do those two steps. 
take observation? Uh, um, we could we could do observations, but I think so. Be besides just averaging, I think we want to look at what's the standard deviation. Anybody remember what the standard deviation is in math? You don't need to tell me the formula. Just tell me in words what it means. Like how far the points are from each other. So it's 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 a measure of how with the average distance of the measured values from the average of all the measured values. So it tells you how good your your average is. So if you have an average value. And you can calculate an average value with two data points, right? Yes. Say yes, right? Add them yes. together, divide by two. So you can calculate, you need, I think, three data points to calculate a standard deviation. So it's a little bit better, but it, it's telling us on average how far away from the, the number are we. So if our standard deviation is a big number, then our average doesn't tell us very much. We have a lot of uncertainty in what the true value is. But if we keep getting more and more measurements and our standard deviations go down, eventually our standard deviation is not gonna change even if we add more measurements. So that tells us how many measurements we should make. <laughs> I, have, I have an extra face in front of me right now. One of my daughters is, is oh no, she's hiding under the table now. Um, so if I start laughing, it's not necessarily because you said something funny. Sometimes I think funny thoughts and sometimes there's people in the room trying to distract me. Okay. All right. So standard deviation. All right. I'm going to sample the surface, but we can get close to the true value. All right. That's enough about that. Let me get back to the screen share. Share the screen. Do I have a helper? Look at that. Share screen. One. Share. There is a thingy that you can help with. It's next week, sweetie. Yeah, well, it's gonna be next week. Sorry, I talked too long on the old. I talked too long on the other stuff. Next week, Emily's gonna help us do an experiment that we're gonna do in class. Okay, you're not quite tall enough. You need like a stool to stand on when you want to stand next to me. All right, so scientists measure to understand, engineers measure to control. I actually have a haiku on that topic if you want to find it at torbjornbergstrom.com slash haiku. Um, let's see, CMMs, coordinate measuring machines. So this is a way that we can make measurements of parts, right? You guys are using calipers to make measurements for the lab stuff. If we use a coordinate measuring machine, it has a little... It's, uh, they can be manual or uh, CNC, so they could be computer controlled or manual. It's got a little tip on it, it comes over, it touches a surface, a switch activates, it knows where it is in its motion and it can make 3D pictures of surfaces. They, uh, in industry, people tend to say, oh, if we measured it with a CMM, our measurement is correct. Uh, that may or may not be true. There can be a lot of measurement uncertainty in CMMs. Um, and it's really only as good as the last time you calibrated it and the way you set it up. Um, what is it? What is it that we can measure? So, or, or what is it that we should measure? Right? We, we've decided that to, to do quality control, we should measure the things that the customer cares about. Right? But, but, what can we measure? What can we measure? Anybody? Almost everything. Right. Almost everything. Let's uh, let's name some things. Depth. So I'm going to call that length. It's it's depth, width, height are all length. Let's say again. Volume. Volume Area. is just length times three. Area is length times two. Weight. 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 
What else can we measure? Density. Density. Is density just volume divided by mass or weight? So we can, or I'll, I'll write it. What else can we measure? Um, roughness or smoothness. So roughness yes, or smoothness. And that was a good guess because today's lecture is supposed to concentrate on surface metrology. And so what do we care about surfaces? We care about their location, right? So we care about the geometric position of the surface, but we also care about the roughness or smoothness of the surface. How do you measure roughness? Oh, wait, are there more things we can measure? Ductility. Ductility. Or hardness. Yeah. What else? Ductility is like the inverse of hardness, right? I think mathematically it is pretty close. Close at least. Um, what else can we measure? We can measure color. I once made a colorometer to measure color. What else can we measure? Heat. Sound. Sound. Say again. Heat. Temperature. What else? You measure cost. We should measure cost. What else can we measure? Strength, like a tensile strength. Strength. What else can we measure? Uh, the ability to conduct electricity. Conductivity. What else could we measure? Time. What else could we measure? Uh, magnetism, magnetic fields. Yeah, mag magnetism. Magnetism. Radioactivity. Oh, that's all right. Uh, yeah, radioactivity, electromagnetism, radioactivity. We measure light emitted. Right, we can measure sound. Did I put sound up here yet? I guess that maybe electromagnetism, it's all waves and stuff, right? So we can measure lots of things. We should measure the things the customer tells us to care about. Um, but you can basically measure anything that you could put a number next to. So if you can quantify it with a number, you can measure it. And that can be a quantitative measurement at that point. And quantitative measurements, so there's, there's also qualitative measurements, right? And qualitative measurements matter in manufacturing because it, it, it's part of how does the customer feel about it? Does that make sense? But if we're, if we're gonna, yeah. if, if we care how the customer feels about it, we're gonna have to, um, we're gonna have to have some way to quantify that feeling. So we're gonna, we're gonna be measuring other things at that point also. Go back to the screen share. Share. Okay. So there's different ways we can measure stuff. Here we have roughness, electrical, chemical, magnetism, microstructure, stiffness, hardness, ductility. There's anything that all kinds of different things that you can measure. But uh, but we want to talk about surface roughness or surfaces today. So how do you measure a surface? You could you so what do you, what do you want to know about a surface if you're measuring it? It's texture. So we want to know something about texture of the surface if we're measuring. So what does texture mean? Uh, like what it feels like. 
And actually, in we don't use the word texture a lot in surface metrology because surface metrology is also important in food science. And in food science, the word texture has a very specific meaning. And it's about like how the thing feels on your tongue. So I don't know how they quantify it, but they have people, they have texture measurer people to Wouldn't do that. Wouldn't that be opinion-based though? Uh, yeah, but they've got people with calibrated tongues, I guess. I don't know what they use to calibrate them. It's like, like cat tongues, maybe they look the sandpaperish on there and they get a French kiss a cat and then they could calibrate their tongue. I don't know how that works exactly. Oh, but, uh, but so, so we don't, although in common speak, we use the word texture all the time to mean what you're talking about. But what is texture made up of uh, in, the, in the surface area? Mm. I'm, I'm, I'm imagining the texture of a Triscuit on my tongue right now. A Triscuit with some cheddar cheese on top. <sighs> I'm going to have to go to the grocery store, I think. Okay, but, uh, but what do we mean when we're talking about surfaces and we say texture? How like uniform or rough the surface is? So how uniform or rough the surface is. And so what we're typically thinking about when we talk about surface roughness is how many ups and downs are there across the surface, right? And so if we're thinking about surface roughness, we're, we're typically thinking about how many ups and downs there are on the sur as it goes across the surface. And uh, you guys see the whiteboard, right? Not the screen share? Yes. Yeah. We okay, can, perfect. We, yeah. We, we, All right. So how do you measure how much, how many ups and downs you have on a surface? You right, have to- My three-dimensional surface here. What's up? Like pick an area, like a section. Of so you have area. to pick. You have to pick the location on the surface that you want to measure. Yep, we're gonna do that first. Then how how could you measure this? Uh, you can scan it in using like an Olympus microscope and then view it on Mountain's map. You could. So you could get an aerial me measurement of the surface. It's speaking as someone who's done this before. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Right, so we could get an aerial measurement of the surface. What is that aerial measurement made up of? How, how do you, so if you looked at the raw data from that aerial measure, what would you have? It's kind of like a contour map. It is like, it's absolutely like a contour map. It's exactly like a contour map. And, and the way they do it, with the well with that olympus microscope that she mentioned specifically is that it's a it's a microscope and we've all looked through a microscope before in science class and the focal depth of this microscope is restricted because of a uh a, a, the olympus uses a spinning nipkov disc i believe so there's a little it only allows a point of light through at an instant and when you only allow that point of light through at an instant you you're getting a very narrow focal plane and so you'll have some stuff that's in focus and everything else will be out of focus. And then if you gradually move the microscope head up through that surface, different spots will become in focus. And it builds a map of the surface, a three-dimensional map where, where it knows that at what height these different points are in focus. It does that, it gives us a three-dimensional topographical map of the surface, which is really, made up of a series of profiles through the surface. So before we had those three-dimensional measurement tools that we used, actually the first tool that was used for measuring surface roughness that was published about was in the 19, uh, early 1930s, I think, late 1920s. And it was totally using a microscope and doing different focal depths. Um, then they realized if they took a record player needle and they dragged it across the surface, or I guess maybe then it was a Victrola needle and dragged it across the surface, it would go up and down. It would actually generate a signal coming back just the way records work. And, um, and you could get a two-dimensional profile of that three-dimensional surface. And we've spent most of our history looking at surfaces by, uh, by looking at those two-dimensional profiles. Go back to my screen share. 
And, uh, and so a surface, well, surfaces have different behaviors, right? The reason we care about measuring surfaces is because in our manufacturing process, we're making the surfaces as the customers use the parts that we made, the surfaces have to behave in certain ways. Our surface metrology is how we pull all this together. Um, <clears throat> even the most controlled manufacturing processes at some scale of measurement tend to create chaotic geometry on the surface. Uh, but this is an example of a surface that was measured with an Olympus spinning Nipkov disc uh, confocal microscope, I believe. So uh, this surface right here, you don't really know much about this. This could be the surface of the moon or it could be the surface of the bottom of somebody's shoe or it could be the surface on the edge of a uh, the edge of a conductor on a microchip those would they could all look like this in this picture because we don't have any scale on our surface but we'll call it topography instead of texture uh, we we'll talk about roughness waviness and lay and uh, and then these surfaces at some scale tend to be chaotic All right, so let's talk about the difference between roughness, waviness, and lay. So if we have, and, and I'm going to use for my example, these, these two-dimensional profiles, even though you get more information out of a 3D scan of a surface. Um, if, we, if we use the two-dimensional profile, it helps us model this. It helps us think about it just a little bit. But if we had a surface, that looks like this. So you can clearly see this sinusoidal waviness in that surface, right? Sorry, there's a crisis in the other room there but I think my wife's got it under control. If you look at this surface here, you can clearly see this sinusoidal waviness in it. And you can also see that superimposed on that sign, there's another frequency going on. Does everybody see that? As we go across that surface? Yeah. And so, yeah. so waviness would be flattening this surface out into that component. And the sine wave. So you could, if you, if you could estimate what that sine wave is, you could mathematically separate the two things. This is the roughness and this is the waviness that's left over. And so in different applications, the, the waviness and the roughness are going to have different impacts on how the surfaces interact and how they work together. Does that, that sort of make sense to you? Yeah. Yeah. Just okay. I don't know why Siri keeps thinking I'm talking to her. Okay. I found this on the web for who directed Ollie work together. Check it out. But maybe she wanted to tell me something. Okay, so you can separate those two different things. They'll, they'll matter differently in different circumstances. The lay on a surface is, um, is the directionality and you have to have a three dimensional surface to, to, to see this directionality. Cause I'm not the only one that's got music going on, huh? Somebody, uh, somebody's listening to music and needs to mute their mic, I think. Got it. I mean, I enjoyed the music. <laughs> but, um, all right. So, roughness and waviness. The lay, so have you ever looked at a, a field that's been plowed? 
So before the farmer puts the crops in the field, you, you see all the, the rows that the, the farmer plowed into the field. And, and so if you look at that, that surface definitely has direction, right? And you can look at it and you can know what the direction is. And it's aligned with those rows that go along the surface. And so that's the, that's the lay of the surface. Um, and I'm not gonna say too much more about lay Mostly because if I start talking about it too much more, we could talk for a long time. Um, the, my, my PhD was in how to use chaos theory to understand lay and, and surface roughness. And we could talk about that for a long time. So I'm going to skip most of that now, but it's the directionality on the surface. So roughness, waviness, and lay make up the surfaces. The manufacturer or the designer may have certain roughness characterizations that they want. Has anybody ever seen the side of a, a spray paint can? You guys are old enough to buy spray paint, right? Yeah, you got to be 18 to buy spray paint. So most of you are probably old enough to buy spray paint. If you look at the side of the spray paint can, it says roughen the surface with sandpaper before applying the paint. Anybody ever read that direction? Yes. How rough? It's not specific. It's very not specific. Do you know why it's not specific? It's because they don't know. Um, and, and so, but that surface roughness matters, right? So if you put it on a high glossy surface, it's not gonna stick. If you sand that surface a little bit, it's gonna stick. If you sand that surface too much, it's gonna be too rough. The same thing, look at the finish on a car. If, uh, if the car has been repaired by an amateur, and some of you may be driving cars that have been repaired by amateurs, I don't know, but uh, the, the body work will look either rough or slick and smooth. It has to do with that surface preparation. Also, it has to do with the way the paint lays down into it. So that surface roughness is important there. Let me see what else we got in the slides. We got almost eight minutes left to go. Screen sharing, share screen, share. All right, so on a turned surface, we could actually predict something about this peak to valley roughness. And so that peak to valley is the distance from the top of the tip to the bottom of the valley here. And remember when I drew the, the turning thing on the board, as the nose of the tool goes across the place we make this regular scalloped feature and so you can actually calculate that that rt value so this this height here from the cord to the bottom of the valley that rt is about equal to f squared 8r where r is the nose radius of the tool and so if you're try if you know you want to have that value be a certain number you can set, so F here is the feed rate, oops. F here is the feed rate. So that's how fast in inches per revolution you're moving the tool across the, the workpiece. So you can design your process variables to get dirt different uh, design parameters by doing things like that. There's a similar equation for, um, for side milling and there are equations like that for face milling and things like that. It depends on the tool, it depends on the radius and the, the cutting parameters. So this is a surface profile measure, uh, profiler here. And this is a typical measurement that it got from a, uh, from a turned surface. And so you can clearly see the ups and downs as we go across that turned surface. You can see some waviness going through that surface. And you can also see that it's not flat, it's on an angle. And so you can adjust that angle by, by moving the, the, the piece, right? So I could change the orientation of the part. <coughs> Excuse me. And it would change that angle. You take it away. But we could also do it in software. And so what we do in software is we take a best fit line. So at least squares best fit line to all the data points. And we subtract that from all the data points. And then that makes a leveled surface, which I hope the next picture shows. No, nope. makes a leveled surface. Well, this is, this is a cartoon of a leveled surface. 
makes a leveled surface where the, the mean value equals zero. And when you have that leveled surface with the mean value equaling, equaling zero, you can calculate some different parameters. So we've got this RT parameter, and that's the peak to valley height that we just talked about. We've got an RP, that's the average height of the peaks above the mean line. An RV, guess average height of the valleys or depth of the valleys below that mean line. And so there's some, some simple parameters that we can calculate about the surfaces just by having that profile. If you have a three-dimensional topography, you can calculate all these same parameters from a three-dimensional topography also, except instead of R, we call them S. Or so just to differentiate. So the most common surface roughness measure used in the United States is this RA. And it's just the average value of all the peaks, or sorry, all the measured points from the mean line. So RA is this average measure of roughness. If you're in any country other than the United States, the most commonly used uh, measure is the RMS roughness, this RQ value, which is basically the standard deviation instead of the average. And so these values are correlated with each other um, and they're used on almost all engineering drawings where they call out a surface roughness parameter to specify what the right roughness is. Does anybody see any problem with using RA to specify the roughness on a surface? Why might I not want to do that? It's an average? It is an average. Um, average isn't necessarily bad, but what is, what is it an average of? It's an average of the amplitude, right? It's an average of the heights of the measured points. And it doesn't take any account of the distance between them or whether some of them are bigger than others. And so if you use RA, you could have a surface that looks like this, have an equal RA to a surface that looks like this or a surface that looks like this. And clearly in performance, they would all act differently. I think there's only one that you would want to sit on, for example. And so, so those surfaces, RA can, if you know what the manufacturing process is, you can use RA to control the process. But if you're trying to understand how the surface is going to work, you're going to have to have something more, um, something that has more information, has more spatial information than just RA. Um, another quick point, I mentioned that we are, are the most common parameter is RA. The most common way of measuring is still with that record player needle that you drag across the, the surface. It's got a diamond tip here. So it's about a five microns a sketch of ones, five micron radius spherical tip on the end of a little stylus that gets dragged across the top of the surface to make the profile. And after you do it, you have machined the surface. And this, so this is a scanning electron microscope measurement of a hardened aluminum alloy that was measured with a stylus profiler. And so you can see that stylus profiler isn't really measuring the surface, is measuring its interaction with the surface. And every time you make a measurement, you make a little scratch on the surface. Now, fortunately, you have to have a scanning electron microscope to find the scratch. Um, and they're actually really hard to find even when you have one, but that's a thing. Also, we talked about the difference of roughness and waviness here. So when you take that waviness profile out, it depends on what mathematical parameters you use to calculate your waviness profile. And so right here, I've got an example with, with the same measured data and, uh, and two different methods for taking the waviness out. And the RA varies by 41%, the RZ by 39%. And so you can see that if you care about what the surface roughness is for the performance of your part and you're the designer, you not only have to say what the surface roughness is, you have to tell the manufacturing people how to measure it and what the measurement parameters are. And the, uh, the standards for how to put that on the drawing all actually allow you to do that. Um, we're gonna talk about quality versus process control a little bit later in class. So I think, we're good. 
I finished the content that I wanted to and only went two minutes over the time. And only once had to step out of the room to ask my kids to be quiet. Well, that was kid. That was only one kid. Uh, and who was watching TikTok in class? Hi. It was not TikTok in my defense. Yeah. Oh, okay. Should I should I post TikTok videos about this content? Because yeah. I have an account. Absolutely. Would you guys watch it if I made if I made engineering TikTok videos? Without a doubt. Yeah, that would be great. I, I'm, I yeah. probably wouldn't. Give Somebody asked, what is my TikTok account? I'll have to figure it out, but it's probably Professor Bergstrom. Share the links. Do it. All right. I will do I will do a TikTok before our next lecture, which is going to be on Tuesday, right? Yes. Say yes yeah. now. Okay, good. So we're going to talk again on Tuesday. And next week, we're going to do three lectures. The quiz is up. Um, if you believe that it's grading something incorrectly, don't keep beating your head against it, trying to figure out what it thinks the right answer is. Let me know. I may be able to confirm that it's grading incorrectly, but I can't fix it until the quiz is over. Um, but if, if we find that, we'll post it in the discussion forum somewhere too. Um, and oh, 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 discussion post. Yeah, I'm going to skip the second discussion post this week. I'll, I'll delete it right now out of the schedule. Where is the first discussion post? Yeah, what was the first discussion post? I don't remember. Wire service is important. Um, wire service is important in manufacturing. Um, I, I can go put a link in there unless somebody's already started a thread but I'll delete this one. And so we'll just do this one and have it do Sunday. So we are writing why services are important. That's the one that we're responding to. Yeah, we'll just do that one. For and Sunday. I want that to say PM. Yeah, and I'm gonna delete this one. All right, and I'm in Canvas right now, so I will go over here to class discussion, add discussion, why our service is important in manufacturing. Do this one Sunday. All right, so that, oh, publish. Now it's up. All right, um, have a nice weekend. Stay warm, dry, clean, wash your face. Don't touch, wait, no, wash your hands, don't touch your face. Don't breathe on people, don't cough on people. And I'll see you guys on Tuesday. Thank you. All right. Has anybody filled Thank out you. the survey about graduation yet? About graduation? The, I guess the people, oh, maybe it only went to faculty. It, it was, was sent I, out this morning, I think. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I just I just saw it just before class started. They're asking people their opinion about how to do it and when to do it, I guess. So if you're graduating, you probably got it. If you're not, you probably didn't get it. All right, I'll talk to you guys later. All right, bye. Thank you.